Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I've got a whole pile of new old stock computer parts. How about we hang out and build a retro PC? So all of these are parts that my friends over at Free Geek Twin Cities have accumulated over the years. Almost all of them are brand new sealed parts from the late 90s to early 2000s. There are a couple of exceptions here and there, and we'll get to those as we go through each of these items. But we do have enough at this point to build effectively a new retro PC. I'm targeting that late 90s, early 2000s era for a couple of reasons. One, because that's really what a lot of these parts kind of match up with. And two, because that's a pretty popular era to be targeting these days. Kind of that Windows 98, early Windows XP era. And I've got a lot of sentimentality about it as well because I worked at a computer store during that time period. So I recognize a lot of these parts and probably built a lot of these parts into a bunch of systems back then too. So this is gonna be a trip down memory lane for some of you, but also for me as well. Every computer needs a case, so let's, uh, let's start with that. This one's made by StarTech. I think it's from kind of the early 2000s or so. The box has been opened, but my understanding is the case itself has never been built into a system. It's a fairly run-of-the-mill micro ATX case. It's got two five and a quarter bays, two three and a half bays, plus an extra hard drive tray underneath, um, some front panel connectivity. This one says it comes with a 250 watt power supply that it's Pentium 4 compatible, kind of dates it a little bit. 250 might be enough for this build. We'll see as we go. Otherwise, you know, solid metal case with I don't think it's too ugly, plastic front bezel and, and that sort of thing. Um, let's get out of the box and see if it's any good. So yeah, not too bad. Um, I've certainly seen uglier cases from this time period. This one isn't overly flashy or exciting, but I think it looks pretty good. Front panel, USB, sound in and out, and firewire. We'll see if we can make use of that firewire port. I'm not quite sure. Uh-oh, all right, well. So it was supposed to come with a power supply. I'm guessing this one got taken out for some reason. Doesn't look like the case has really been messed with otherwise. Um, let's pop the side panel off and see what it looks like on the inside. Yeah, I mean, it definitely doesn't look like it's ever been built into a system. All the accessories and whatnot are here. Random piece of trash. Okay. Oh, power supply cable. There's no power supply. I wonder what happened there. All right, well, thankfully I've got a backup plan. And it's this new old stock power supply. Price tag on here says $19. I don't know if that's the original price or if this came from a thrift store at some point that it got repriced. I've never heard of Echo Star before this brand, but during the late 90s, early 2000s, there were a lot of off-brand parts, you know, just like there are now. So that doesn't necessarily mean that this is a bad part. Um, well, we got another power cable, okay. It doesn't weigh a ton, I'll be honest with you. So something important to talk about is these power supplies. I mean, this is new old stock, 20 plus years old capacitors, right? In the late 90s, early 2000s, just like there are now, capacitors have always been a problem with electronic parts and failing early or the manufacturing using cheap parts, that sort of thing. I'm not just going to slap this in the case and build a system and turn it on and hope it doesn't fry anything. We need to test it. How are we going to test it? With a new old stock power supply tester, of course. <laughs> this one's from CompUSA. Cost six bucks. Can you believe that? Um, this one is a 24 pin power supply tester. Plus there's some extra connectors on the bottom. Now it does reference SATA power connections. There's no date on here, but I think that kind of dates this as being like a mid 2000s type of item, but it's going to work just fine, even though it's a 24 pin connector going into a 20 pin power supply. Um, 
I have no doubt that at least we'll get an idea as to whether this power supply is any good. So let me get it hooked up and we'll we'll see if it works. Well, damn it, I wish I was filming while I was just setting this up. I, uh, I plugged the power cord into the power supply. The power supply is turned off, not hooked up to anything. And out of the fan grate, I got a big pop and like a spark. And so, yeah, um, I don't even think we need the tester on this power supply. This thing, it's done. Uh, thankfully, we've got a backup plan. And it's this, another new old stock power supply. <laughs> uh, Diablo Tech, this one says it's a 350 watt. Um, looks like it's definitely gonna be a little bit higher end. It's got an additional fan to, you know, get through the unit cooling going a little bit better. Vibration dampener included. Um, this one's got SATA power on it. So again, kind of a mid, yeah, here we go. 2011 date on it. It's gonna work just fine. It means it's a 24 pin power supply, but it says it's 20 slash 24 pins. So we can disconnect the, uh, the additional four pins cause the motherboard's not gonna need them. Let's go ahead and test this one out. And I promise I'll film while I plug it in to see if we get any more explosions. Contact. Ooh, okay, are we safe? Didn't blow up. All right, at least not yet. Let's get the um, the motherboard power supply, motherboard connector in there. All right. Oh, and the fan's kicking in. I think this power supply is good. We're not getting negative five volts, but I don't think we're supposed to. But everything else looks fine. So, uh, okay, cool. So it looks like to get the power supply in here, I actually have to take the top of the case off. There's just a screw in the back for that and then it should slide, but I probably need to take the front bezel off. So let's just go ahead and get this case taken apart so we can start throwing stuff in it. All right. These side panels are actually pretty decently thick and heavy. This case does not feel flimsy at all. I'm kind of impressed. What is this? Random like bits of hot glue in these upper corners. Why did they do that? That's weird. I have no idea if this vibration dampener thing is actually going to do any good. I mean, it can't can't really hurt as long as it, you know, fits inside the case, but I mean, retro PCs were just kind of loud and rattly and everything anyway, right? So I might actually be uh, doing this thing a little bit of a disservice if I were to try to quiet it down too much, but whatever. Yeah, this rubber isolator thing is kind of a pain because it doesn't really want to stay in place. And it also, yeah, it's preventing the power supply from fitting correctly. All right, screw it. Let's go noisy rattly mode. There we go. That's a lot better. I remember a really popular thing to do back during this time period before we really had like power supplies that were designed specifically to be quiet is people would cut out these fan grates because some of the fan grates didn't have very good airflow. So people would just chop them out to try and reduce kind of that air turbulence noise. Sometimes it was actually pretty effective when they would do that. Other times all it did was just leave little sharp metal bits for you to cut your hands on. So every computer needs a motherboard and this is the one we're gonna go with. And this unfortunately is one of just a couple of parts that we had to get as used parts. This is an Intel 815 series motherboard. And if you look on eBay, the prices for new old stock boards like this from a variety of manufacturers are absolutely insane. I mean, we're talking hundreds of dollars for a new old stock board. Uh, it just couldn't justify that, right? And it would probably be forever if one ever came in to Free Geek. So we simply decided to go with a used board. This one's been tested and we know it works. Um, we've also got some RAM. This is PC-133, 256 megabytes. It's Micron, so it's good quality. The 
This is kind of a middle of the road board when it comes to features. It's a Gigabyte GA6 IEM. It's got EGP, three PCI slots, two IDE channels, floppy, 20 pin power. It has onboard sound, but I don't think we're gonna use it. Um, it also has onboard video, and likewise, I don't think we're gonna use it. There was another version of this board, as I understand, that came with onboard networking. This one doesn't have it, but I don't think that's such a big deal. I'm not gonna worry about networking in this episode, but if whoever ends up with this system, and we'll talk about where the system goes later, um, they can just throw in a PCI network card, no problem. So we've got a motherboard, we've got some RAM, but there's an important thing that needs to go in this socket. What are we gonna put in there? We're gonna go with this, a Pentium 3, one gigahertz. This is the 133 system bus version. The packaging lists a pack date of August 2001, so it's still well within the date range that we're going for with this build. Shrink wrapped, sealed, never used. It also includes a heatsink slash fan combo. And you know, it's just crazy how quickly processor speeds accelerated during that late 90s, early 2000s time period. I remember in 99 working at that computer store that like a 500 megahertz CPU, 500 meg either K62 or Pentium 3, you were in really good shape if you had one of those. Yet just two years later, they've already got clock speeds up to one gigahertz. So that was a very good time to be involved in computing. I've got a lot of nostalgia for that time period. And I think I'm not the only one who kind of considers that a golden age in computing, just with the rapid advancement of technology and how exciting things were back then. It's something I think that's gonna be kind of tough to capture again. Now, an important discussion to be had is about the nature of these, you know, sealed package parts that are retro. Does it, you know, hurt things? Does it help things if one were to go through and unwrap them as I'm doing? Well, I mean, there's differences of opinion, of course, right? Some people say, oh no, these are museum pieces and they should be, you know, stay sealed and, you know, it's worth a lot more money and whatever if you leave them all wrapped up. And yeah, I mean, probably could have taken all these parts and flipped them on eBay and made a couple of bucks. But if this can get put into a system and be used and enjoyed by someone, then it's fulfilling a purpose as well. I mean, you're free to disagree with me. I think the opinions on this topic are kind of all over the place, but you know, as part of like Free Geek's mission and my own philosophies on this stuff, I, I, I have no problems opening this package. I'm gonna keep all the packaging from all the parts that we put in because whoever ends up with the system may appreciate that. But you know, it's, these parts were meant to be used. And I don't think Intel way back when, when they designed all this and sold it, ever thought that, this stuff would eventually become a collector's item. You know, they were meant for a purpose and, well, I think if you can fulfill that purpose, then good for you. All right, so we've got our CPU and the heatsink fan combo. What's interesting is back then, the fan clipped onto the heatsink, but they made you do that separately because of the way the socket worked. We'll, we'll I'll show you that in a second here. So we're all used to the way that CPUs go into the sockets on their motherboards now, right? And the heat sinks just clip on around the outside of them. Well, this was a little bit different with socket 370. First, these chips generally didn't have integrated heat spreaders on them, so that's just the die of the CPU right there. I'm gonna go ahead and get it dropped into the motherboard before anything bad happens. The other th important thing to do is to make sure you're putting it in correctly. Watch, as always, for the, uh, the knocked off corners of the pins. And so that's gonna go in like that. And we latch it down. All right, that's safe. Bending pins and breaking them off, you're screwed if you do that. So the other part is the way that these heat sinks would work. This one does have heat sink compound already on it. Uh, do I trust it? I don't... These CPUs didn't really get all that hot. 
but uh, this compound is 20 plus years old. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and replace it. This stuff is kind of weird. It's not like what we would normally expect out of thermal paste. This is kind of like a really thin thermal pad, but it's supposed to have a little bit of paste-like consistency to it, and I'm just not feeling that on here. So I think we can do better. Let's just go ahead and try and clean this off and uh, put some new paste on there. All right, so I got the heat sink all cleaned up. Uh, what am I gonna do for thermal paste? Arctic MX4. Why? Because it's what I've got on hand. It's probably more than what this thing needs or deserves, but you know, you can't say at least that I'm not trying to give this thing a good chance at thermal efficiency, huh? You don't need a ton of thermal paste. I'm not showing you how much I put on there because you'll yell at me because this is the internet and everything I do is wrong. But uh, the reason that these come without the fan on them is because of the way that these retention clips work or clip, I should say, singular. You get this side on first and it hooks onto the side of the socket and then the other side flips down and then you just push the lever to lock it in place and that's not going anywhere. Then you can take your fan and I don't think it matters which way the fan goes on, but it just then clips to the top of the heatsink. All right, so let's uh, tidy up this power cable for the fan. Conveniently, the way it's uh, coming out of the package, it kind of bundles up nicely. I'm not the biggest fan of zip ties inside computer cases because they kind of become annoying later on if you need to make changes, but this is one situation where I don't think it's going to be much of a problem. Well, except <laughs> when they're 20 year old zip ties. Um, Try the other one. I may need to go grab some new ones. Yep. <laughs> like, they're just... It, that's funny. They just... Okay, brittle plastic. Rears its ugly head again. Okay, third time's a charm. With some new modern zip ties. Yes, I'm using flush cutters. See, no sharp bits. I know better than that. And conveniently, the CPU fan header right there. That's nice and tidy. All right, next up, let's get the RAM installed. I like kind of populating as much as I can with a motherboard before I get it in the case. It's just easier. Um, like I said, these are PC133. These each are 128 megabytes, so we'll get 256, which is going to be a very healthy amount, I think for a machine from this vintage. It doesn't really matter if I did a single 256 or a pair of 128s. This thing didn't have dual channel. That really wasn't a thing back then, so there's no performance difference. I think the board maxes out at 512 megabytes at the top end, uh, if I remember correctly. While I'm thinking about it, I'm gonna go ahead and get the motherboard standoffs installed next. What makes that a lot easier is if you've got one of these, it's called a nut driver. It's basically kind of like a socket on the end that fits these uh, these standoffs. If you don't have one of these and have to do the whole like, you know, twisting it in there with a pair of pliers trick, that sucks. This is so much faster and cleaner and easier. Something else I'm gonna do to try to make life a little bit easier is it looks like just one screw and this whole hard drive or front three and a half inch drive cage will come out. Let's just go ahead and do that now, I think. Yeah, there we go. Oh, that's nice. One more thing I remembered I wanted to do before getting too far is replacing this coin cell. Come on, get out of there. I don't know how old this, this clock battery is. It's just a CR2032, I've got spares. Let's just throw a new one in there for good measure. If this was my own machine, I wouldn't care because I just, I personally don't care if the clock is wrong, but eh, might as well. Now the motherboard came with an IO shield, but 
the case came with this kind of generic one already installed and looking at the port arrangement on this motherboard I think there's a really good chance that we can just roll with this one as is so uh, let's try to get this board installed and see if I'm right there we go getting in the way hey look at that oh nice I like this IO shield a lot better because it's got the color coding and the markings and stuff. It just looks a lot better than the one that came with the board, which is all generic. Next up, I'm going to take care of the case front panel connections, at least as many as I can. Here's just the regular headers for like the power switch and the hard drive activity LED. And then here's that front panel USB connector. Believe it or not, Gigabyte still has the manual for this motherboard on its website. And the manual gives you all sorts of information about how the board works and all the connectors and how everything's wired up. So you don't have to like try to read the silkscreen markings on the board, which in this corner of the board are kind of busy. So just refer to the manual and it tells you how to hook it all up. I've gone ahead and bundled up some of the extra connectors from the power supply that we're just not gonna need, like the four pin that you know, broke away from the 20 pin for the motherboard, uh, the extra 12 volt four pin that would go into uh, the dedicated CPU power socket on a newer motherboard. There was also another tail here that had two SATA power connectors on it. We're not gonna need it. I'm just gone ahead and zip tied them up to get them out of the way. And then let's go and get the motherboard plugged in here. I'm a real big fan of modular power supplies. It's just kind of a bummer that they weren't really a thing back then or not much of a thing I should say I'm sure you could really get one if you wanted all right how about we get some drives installed in this thing next um, two five and a quarters two three and a halves I've only got one optical drive so let's just go ahead and break out the top one and then I've actually got two three and a half inch drives so let's try if we can. Oh, these don't want to twist out so easy. Come on. Okay, the first thing we're going to want is a hard drive. How about, again, a brand new inbox one? This one's kind of interesting. 20 gigabytes, it's IDE. It's Mac store, but it was kind of like a special packaging deal for CompUSA. I vaguely remember some computer stores doing something like this. Something that is interesting is where it gets to talking about the warranty, there's a sticker. The warranty thing here is a sticker that says one year warranty. How much you want to bet that there's a bigger number printed on the box underneath this and CompUSA and or Mac Store cheaped out and decided to shorten the warranty. Now that does remind me that right around the early 2000s, like all the hard drive manufacturers across the board cut their warranties. Like when you bought a drive in the late 90s, a lot of times it came with like a five year warranty. But in the early 2000s, they all cut it down to three years. I wonder if as part of like trying to get this thing to sell at a specific price that Mac Store cut CompUSA a deal. Okay, we'll sell you these drives for a smaller amount of money, but we'll only give you a one year warranty on them now and that deal happened or changed after they had printed all the boxes. Something else interesting about this box is that the barcode has been cut off the side. Um, it's still shrink wrapped seal, it's never been opened, but clearly someone cut the UPC off the side to send it in for like some sort of manufacturer rebate, I guess. There we go. Kind of want to keep the box as intact as possible to keep with the system, just because who knows, people may be interested in that. Actually, fairly nicely packaged, look at this. So here's your floppy disk, Max Blast, hard drive utility. I'm guessing this is just for formatting. Uh, you got some instructions. Yeah, we already know how to put a hard drive in the computer. Oh, look at this. Yep, so they give you a ribbon cable and a pair of brackets in case you need to install this in a five and a quarter bay. I'm not gonna need the brackets, but I'll hang on to this ribbon cable because it's actually nicer than the other ones that I've got. But look at this nice foam, and I'm surprised the foam hasn't completely like turned to goo because this kind of foam likes to do that over time. And then ooh, all nestled in here, Diamond Max hard drive. 
still all static bagged up from like 20 years ago. Maxter, incidentally, was purchased by Seagate uh, quite a long time ago, in fact. Some people didn't really see that as much of a problem because, you know, Maxter was a proficient seller of hard drives, but they didn't necessarily have the best reputation. All right, let's see what kind of warranty originally came with this drive, if we can. Yeah, there it is. Used to be a three-year warranty, and then they cheaped out or cut a deal or whatever down to one year. It would make sense to put a floppy drive in this computer, so I am. This is, unfortunately, another one of those deals where we just didn't have a new inbox one. It didn't have one come through in, like, a very long time. So this is a used drive. However, it's been tested. It's known to work. It's period accurate. I mean, it's a three and a half inch floppy drive made by Sony. It's going to be good. We'll just throw it in there. Now, this is otherwise going to be a very straightforward build, right? The whole idea is just kind of period accurate, like mainstream. If you had like 1500 bucks to spend in the year 2000 or 2001, what would you put together, right? As close as we can get to that. But I want to add one little bit of quirkiness to this machine, just to kind of give it a little bit of extra interest. And we're going to do that with this, an Imation Super Disk Drive, also known as LS120. This was a direct competitor to the Zip Disk. However, it just didn't really do very well. From what I remember, the Zip Disk came out kind of in the mid 90s and it just got instantly popular, right? The Zip 100 drive just took over the computer market by storm. Everybody had one. It worked good enough for the time. And then Imation, which was actually a spinoff of 3M, they decided to try and get into the game, but they got into it a little bit too late. And they figured, okay, maybe they could make inroads by adding backwards compatibility. So as you can see on the front, the whole idea was LS120 discs were the same form factor as regular three and a half inch floppies. So the drive could accept both. At the time, even though Zip was popular, people still used floppy disks. Didn't work. <laughs> I mean, some people bought into, into LS120, but for the most part, this thing really just kind of fell flat, which is a bummer because it was an interesting and novel format. But I think as a little bit of a quirk, I'm gonna throw it in. Now, why am I gonna do an LS120 drive in addition to a regular floppy disk drive? Well, that's because this thing actually uses an IDE interface instead of the traditional floppy interface. That gives you better speed, of course, because the disks are bigger. I mean, it takes long enough to read or write a regular floppy. Could you imagine dragging that out over 120 megabytes worth of data? But I also have concerns that the motherboard may not be able to boot from a regular floppy disk through this drive. I'm just not sure of that compatibility. So I'm going to throw both in. It doesn't really hurt anything. And it just could prove to be an interesting little conversation piece when people see the finished machine. Also, kind of like with the hard drive, this is another case of uh, someone clipping the UPC out of the bottom of the box, probably for some sort of rebate, which is, you know, listed on the front, you can get 20 bucks back. Now, they didn't peel the rebate form off the box to send it in. So did they remember even to send it in? I don't know, but whatever. Let's get this thing taken out. The lighting today is absolutely horrible. Why did I have to pick a partly cloudy day to do this? All right, another installation kit. Um, this probably also takes you from three and a half up to a five and a quarter bay. I'm starting to amass a collection of those, it seems. $5 rebate when you buy some discs. I doubt they're still honoring that. In fact, Imation doesn't, they still exist, but they're not in this market anymore. Driver diskette, we are going to need that for sure. And the drive itself, all neatly wrapped up. And I believe the packaging said this was made in Japan. And then another IDE cable, just kind of a generic one, weird stain on there. And finally, 
a neat uh, little case badge that we'll throw on the front later. All right, and because we've got this nice, neat, separate cage assembly, we can install all the drives before we put them in the case. That's kind of neat. They've got little shock mounts for the drive. I appreciate that. I like that. Hopefully the uh, rubber things actually do something and not just look pretty. All right, I think it makes the most sense to put the LS120 in the lower three and a half inch bay. What's up with this piece of card? Is there something? Oh, okay, yeah. So they wanted to protect the, uh, the circuitry on the bottom of the drive. And then it looks like there's kind of, yeah, these spring-loaded latches to help hold everything together. Okay, so this uses a Berg connector. Ooh, I just realized this power supply has only got one Berg connector on it, and I'm going to need that for the floppy disk. We'll look, maybe they included uh, an accessory in the box that I didn't see to adapt. Uh, I hope so. Was, all right, so it goes in there, something like that. Go ahead and at least just get the carrier itself screwed back into place. I'll worry about the final positioning, like front to back, of the, the two drives when I get the front bezel on, because it'll change, right? An optical drive would be kind of nice, so uh, how about a CD burner? Very period accurate, at least in terms of what people were going for. If you were really rolling in, you know, 2000, 2001, you'd have a DVD reader in one bay and a CD burner in the other, but I don't have an inbox DVD reader. This one is a little bit later because of the speed. The 52 times didn't come along, you know, until a little bit later, but it's it's still pretty close. It is an IDE interface. This is another one where it's it's brand new in package, but somebody also cut the UPC out, you know, again for a rebate. But you can see on the back here, the seal is still intact. So uh, no one's been in here. And the packaging does say that this is compatible with Windows 98. So it's gonna be, you know, fairly period accurate. All right, let's see what we get with this drive. I'm guessing at least another IDE ribbon cable. Yep. Well, no. Did I? Oh, interesting. No IDE ribbon, but an audio cable and some screws and a copy of Nero. This was a very common uh, pack-in CD burning software. The other one that was really popular during this time period was Adaptic Easy CD Creator. Um, both worked pretty well. I don't think there's too much of a preference either way. Okay, manufactured 2003. So we're actually not too far off, just a couple years ahead. And again, we've got these like quick release latches on the side. And I'm gonna go into the top bay just to, actually let's check the jumpers real quick, should be. Oh no, they've got this thing set to secondary. So I've got the hard drive, the LS120 and the CD-ROM. And with the way these cables work, I do have enough length. So let's do, yeah, let's do the CD-ROM as primary, and then I'll go in and re-jumper the LS120 as secondary. That'll make things easy, because then the hard drive can be on its own IDE channel. So let's start to get some of the data cabling going for those drives, and I'm not going to go too insane with, you know, cable management. Like, I like having nice, neat cabling, but I'm not going to go, like, super OCD or whatever. However, these IDE cables are kind of a pain unless you try to manage them. So I've done this. No, it does not damage an IDE cable to fold it. But what doing it this way lets me do is I shall show you. So the red connector is the primary IDE channel and the white one is the secondary. I'm gonna put the hard drive on that primary IDE channel. And what folding that cable allows me to do is keep it all nice and neat right like that and in fact sometimes with case kits they would include little plastic clips that you could clip you know extra folds in ide cables and floppy cables and stuff together but 
This is infinitely better than if I just thrown the cable in there and let it just hang loose and turn into a giant rat's nest. And I'm kind of realizing that putting this drive cage in now made life a little harder for myself when it comes to that floppy ribbon cable. Um, because it's actually behind back in there. <laughs> oh well. And of course this floppy cable is about a thousand miles long too. Alright, so I'm just using a bit of that Velcro like cable wrap just to hold this together. Like I was saying about those clips, I wish they had included a bunch of those plastic cable clips. I'm sure you can 3D print something. There's probably something out there and if I was thinking ahead I would have done that, but it's fine. This will work. I could have gone with those rounded cables and I could have even rounded these cables, but when you can fold them like this to keep them tidy, that works just as well. Hey, I was worried I wouldn't have a second Berg power connector for the LS120 drive. I think I lucked out. This one says DC cable. This is the kit that came with it. Big beefy brackets. Yes. Okay, phew. Guess it only needs the two wires, but we'll we'll give this a shot. Another IDE, brand new ribbon cable. So we're going to put the optical drive and the LS120 on the same IDE channel. Um, I don't think too often we're going to be burning CDs directly from LS120. So if you had two optical drives and you did a lot of disc copying, this is super old school. You know, you did a lot of like copying one CD to another, then you'd want the two drives on different IDE channels, right? Because it's parallel ATA. Um, if you do a lot of burning CDs from a hard drive, then you want the hard drive and the CD burner to be on different channels. Basically, wherever the data is coming from and your burner should be on different channels, however you do it. All right, let's get power going to those drives. I've got this lead that's got two Molex and a Berg on it. So we're going to do the first Molex for the hard drive. And then the second Molex will go into this adapter for the LS120. Yeah, this will tidy up pretty nice. And then the Berg will go in here somehow <laughs> uh, behind all these cables, because I kind of did some of this in the wrong order, um, to go into the, the floppy drive. All right, so that tidied up pretty nice. A little bit more of that Velcro cable wrap just keeps this bundle all, all together. And then we'll just do the optical drive off of the other the other power tail here. There we go, nice and tidy. All right, the drives are done. That's the messiest part. Now it's some fun with expansion cards. How about a video card? Yeah, you didn't think I was going to use the onboard graphics, did you? Riva TNT2 Ultra 32 meg. This card is awesome. It's also the deluxe version, which is kind of weird because it includes two things that you wouldn't really necessarily expect. First is that this thing has these like 3D in quotes VR glasses that are included. Um, yeah, VR back then is very different than what we know of VR now. So don't conflate the two. The other thing that's really interesting is not only is this a video output card, but it also seems to have video input and capture capabilities, which is pretty sweet. My understanding is that it also has built in DVD decoding, which is really useful. Even though the drive that we're putting in here is just a CD burner, if later on you want to swap in a DVD drive and watch movies on it, not sure why you would, but if you did, the card can do the MPEG-2 decoding, and that's kind of a big deal because otherwise you'd have to deal with software decoding and not all computers were fast enough to handle that. In fact, if you didn't have a powerful video card that had onboard decoding, but you wanted to add a DVD drive to your computer back then, you could throw in something like this. This is a dedicated DVD playback card and it just has a chipset on it for decoding MPEG-2 video, and it works by kind of passing through 
from your video card. So you can kind of see on the front, this one's sealed as well. I'm not gonna crack it open because we're not gonna use it, but it's got basically a video input that would come from your video card. You'd get a short little stubby video cable that would go between the two, and then you'd plug your monitor into the output on here and it would do like a video overlay kind of a thing. This is just the card. It doesn't even include the DVD drive, but it does include software, thankfully. Um, but yeah, I mean, 99, 2000 DVDs were really starting to take off. And so a card like this would come in super useful. So let's see what you'd get in the box with this guy. I've been told this one is new unused. I mean, it's at least complete in the box, although there's no shrink wrap on it. Composite to S video, S video to S video, composite to composite. That's all talking about that video capture capability. And ah, uh, <laughs> uh, the card is missing. What? Who took that? Where'd you go? It's just, are you kidding? It's just the video cables. Oh, you told me it had everything, but you get the glasses. So, okay, no video card, but here, Colin, you can have these stupid 3D glasses. And the foam, I think was just for, for packaging purposes, but yeah, and they were wired. You had to plug them in to the card because they're like the active shutter type. I don't know. I don't know much about 3D. I don't, I kind of think it's dumb, but yeah, back then, Asus branded 3D glasses, but I got robbed. No video card. I'm going to have to figure out what to do now. That sucks. Sound card. This one we're going to definitely have better luck with because it's still shrink wrapped. <laughs> um, it's another one of those deals where we're like slightly ahead of the target, like time period that we're shooting for, but not by much. Auto G2ZS, this thing goes back to 2004. So pretty close. And I'm hoping that it might tie in kind of nicely with the case. I'm gonna bet that there's front panel audio header on here, but this card also has Firewire on it. And I'm hoping that it's got a Firewire front panel connector on there as well to tie in with the front of the case so that I don't have that port on the front being unused. I'd like to have the whole thing be completely functional if I can, but this is a nice card and I'm kind of surprised that they left it, you know, to go into this build instead of selling it on to someone because these are fairly desirable. So they shrink wrapped it and sealed it. Okay, so I think we're actually going to have a card this time. Big folder full of CDs. There's like a half a dozen CDs in there. And uh, and the card in a box. Uh, Rainbow Six Three, a couple of discs for that. Tomb Raider, a couple of discs for that. Yeah, all right, here we go. Some of the actual software for the card. And DVD audio sampler disc. Um, we don't have a DVD drive, unfortunately, but this card, I guess, can also do DVD audio, one of those kind of high-res formats that no one really ever bought into. All right, and the card itself. There we go. All right, so they give you another. All right, so this is digital audio header from your optical drive. And a game port, if you need it. We've already got one on the motherboard. So I don't think I'm gonna install this, but we'll hang on to it just in case. And then the actual card with a sticker. Oh, okay, so you can label more clearly label the ports on the back by color coding. I see. Okay, so good news and bad news with this card. The good news is that it actually does have a header for an internal Firewire port, like for the front panel, and that'll just plug straight in. The bad news is that while it does have a front panel audio connector, it's in a different form factor than what this case uses. This is a much more standard connector where it's two rows of pins. Um, they just wanted you to do one row of pins. I don't have another connector that's this style that I could like rewire this onto. And frankly, I don't really want to deal with that anyway. 
I looked and no, there really doesn't seem to be a way to use any of these other headers um, to kind of sneaky like plug this in. The Audigy 2 ZS apparently had other versions where it came with like a front panel audio control center thing where you'd have in and output jacks and volume knobs and all that kind of stuff. And they, I guess they kind of really wanted you to just buy that and install it. So it is what it is. Um, we'll just have to go without the front panel audio jacks, which is a bummer, but I've got something also included with the rest of the parts that may kind of make up for that but at least we can get that front panel firewire jack going. I've already gotten the firewire connector from the front panel hooked up. And then interestingly, that CD burner has digital audio output on it. Analog as well, but I might as well use the digital if I can, you know, use the DAC in the audio the sound card here. Let's uh, just kind of try and route this cable so that I can keep it nice and neat. And then and that connector. There we go. So far, the only fans in the system are the ones in the power supply and the CPU fan. I'd like to get one more in here just to kind of help promote some airflow. If I can only do one fan, I prefer to do it in the back blowing out and it'll just kind of passively pull air through the front and of course i've got a new old stock fan to do it unfortunately this isn't a three wire fan although it does have a thermistor on it so it should take care of speed control itself we'll see how horrible it is what's also interesting is it's got some leds on it i don't know what color they are maybe pink we'll see unfortunately the case isn't too kind of like garish or flashy otherwise uh, it would be kind of fun to light this thing up a little more, but that's that's not really quite the feel that I'm going for anyway. But three bucks from the computer exchange. Never heard of them before, but it's uh, one of those types where it's just got the adapter to go to the four pin Molex so we can just tie into this connector here and try to keep the wiring all tidy. Yeah, that's uh, that's fairly neat wiring. Looks good. Okay, so two video card alternatives. Both of these are used, unfortunately, just <laughs> FreeGeek doesn't have any more new inbox retro video cards, imagine that. This bottom one is another TNT2. Uh, it's a 16 megabyte card though, and I feel like for a CPU that's from 2001, uh, this might be leaving some performance on the table, shall we say. This upper card is an ASUS V8170SE. It's the low profile version, though that doesn't really matter. It's a GeForce 4 based card, but it's also 64 megabytes of video memory. And while this card is from early 2002, so it's like a little bit newer than kind of the rest of the build, I don't think it's too far out of place. So I'm feeling like we go with the ASUS this time around. Remember when all you had to do when installing a video card was just install it? You know, now it's like, do you have the right connectors on the card? Do you have the right connectors on your power supply? Does your power supply even have enough juice? This time it was just like, can you plug the card in? Yes, okay, you're good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was so, so much easier. So as a bit of consolation for not having a new inbox video card, I'm going to throw in a new inbox network card. This is an incredibly common part from the late 90s, early 2000s, a 3Com 3C905. It's 10100 because gigabit was just a little bit out of reach for most people at the time, but these were very popular, not just because of price, but because they were really easy to get. A lot of people were finally starting to get into the concept of home networking in the late 90s, early 2000s because of the rise in residential broadband, things like cable internet or DSL. Prior to that, you most likely used dial-up and with dial-up, it's really tough to have multiple computers share that same connection. The benefit to residential broadband, of course, was faster speeds, but also the fact that you could network multiple computers together and have them all share that same connection. So 
an awful lot of people during that time period, if you had one or more PCs and you got home broadband of some sort and you needed a network card, very good chance you had one of these. All right, might as well work on getting this thing buttoned up. Front bezel is next. I know I need to pop out the two three and a half bay covers and the top five and a quarter cover. And yes, I'm going to be keeping all of the spares with it. In fact, I'm keeping all of the spare parts and screws and cables and everything that came with all the different parts and pieces that we installed in here. They're all going to get put back in the box and stay with the system. All right, so the CD-ROM drive lined up, but these guys didn't. So let's uh, loosen them. Oh, neat. Yeah, and then they can just kind of slide forward. Oh, and there's one thing that I can't forget to do. There we go. So the computer's all put together, but what about accessories? Well, how about some new old stock CDRs to go with that CD burner? 40X multi-speed, um, so we may need to slow the drive down a little bit to work with these, but yeah, still all shrink wrap. They all come in uh, those slimline jewel cases, so that's kind of neat. I've also got an assortment of LS120 discs to go with the super disc drive here. Uh, these are three in a box and then just three kind of loose ones. Again, all still wrapped up. This one's got kind of a cool like holographic foil on the front and then they cheaped out and went just back to regular. Input devices, I've got a new old stock, still sealed up Logitech PS2 mouse. And if you look at the packaging on the back, it's got a listing for DPN. In my experience, that refers to Dell part number. So this might have been like an OEM Dell mouse or one that Dell would have thrown in the box with the system. It doesn't have their logo on the front. It still just says Logitech, but it's a, it's a ball mouse. It's got a scroll wheel. Latest in technology for Windows 98, I guess. But, you know, it's sealed. That's nice. And then for keyboard, well, we've got this beast. Let's take a closer look at this guy. All right, so this is one of those ergonomic keyboards, contour keyboard from a company called Mouse Systems. I've never heard of them, but this thing's got kind of an interesting quirk to it. This is another one of those like new in box sorts of deals. But again, like with some of the other boxes, they uh, they cut the barcode off the back so that they could do some kind of mail-in rebate, I guess. Um, the packaging is kind of telling as to what this thing can do. I mean, it's a normal ergonomic keyboard, but it's also got reference to this whole mouse key thing. I guess the idea is that you can press the key in the middle of the split here and toggle it into allowing you to move the mouse pointer using the numeric keypad. I would imagine using that would take quite a bit of getting used to. And then just because they could, they also threw an extra backspace and tab key right above the space bar in the middle as well. In case you use those keys a lot and they can be like, you know, right by your thumb. I don't know. Let's see what this thing looks like. Yeah, okay. So it's actually still in here. I didn't get burgled of this either. Oh, and they uh, included an AT to PS2 adapter. So that's kind of neat. Yeah. Extra random keys in the middle there. It's also got what looks like a power key. What is that for? That's a Mac thing. I don't think that's going to work on a regular PC, but who knows? Um, one thing I am curious about is so that mouse keys thing makes it sound like you need a special control panel and stuff to make that work, right? But all that was included in the box was the manual. No driver disc or anything. Is that something Windows 95 had built in? I don't I don't think so, but whatever. Now I could hook the computer up to a modern LCD, but where's the fun in that? How about instead? Ugh, new old stock CRT. So this is another one of those deals where the box itself is kind of beat up and has been opened before, but the device inside is still brand new, never used. So this is a 17 inch E-Machines CRT. Uh, it's like a silver and black kind of color. 
I know that doesn't perfectly match the case, but the case does have some silver accents on the front, and this thing is primarily silver on the front, so I think it'll be okay. I should have done all of this out at Free Geek. They've got way more space to do this sort of stuff than I do. Oh well. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. Oh, it's one of the front, the, the flat square front ones. Okay, so I learned my lesson the last time with that power supply. I gotta be filming whenever I plug stuff in so we can see if it like blows up. I hope not. Kaboom! No, okay, just kidding. Okay, here we go. Cross fingers. Uh, are the monitor on? Okay, a couple of click sounds that I think were normal and uh, uh, Please work So the computer seems to be running because I saw some activity lights and such but no video on the monitor. Yeah. Shoot. The monitor was sounding like it was gonna work. I'm hearing like relays clicking and stuff in there, but no image at all. All right, well, Rule of thumb when it comes to troubleshooting, the whole divide and conquer thing, is it the monitor or is it the computer? Let's ditch the monitor for now and plug an LCD into the computer and see if we can at least get video out of this thing. Hey, look at that! The computer does work! I'm... I'm glad it was the monitor that was bad and not the computer. It would have been nice to have a CRT to go with it, but whatever. Um, CMOS checks some air probably because I swapped the battery. That's not a big deal. Um, let's go into setup. Okay. I mean, if we wanted to overclock, we could. I don't... Uh, that would be fun, but this video is long enough as it is. Do I really want to go down that path? Anyway, memory frequency 133. That's what I wanted to see. So I think we're actually in good shape here. Let's get an OS installed on here. Since we kind of struck out with that other CRT, how about this one? Unfortunately, it's not new in box, but it's been tested and it's known to work well. KDS was not the biggest name brand for monitors in their day, but they weren't really synonymous with garbage either. They were like a solid value brand, kind of I'd say in line with like ViewSonic and some of those others. What's nice about this particular display is that it uses an actual FD Trinitron CRT. That's technology that Sony developed and instead of having the characteristic curve in the front glass, either horizontal or vertical, the front glass is completely flat. So that helps reduce glare and distortion and all that. It was really kind of the last gasp for CRTs both for computer and television use before LCD took over. And while it needs a little bit of cleaning here and there and somehow the base on it got a little warped, not sure what's up with that. Otherwise, this thing is in really good shape. So I think not just from a period accurate standpoint, but also just cosmetically, I think it'll match up with this machine really well. It's only fitting that we go with a new old stock copy of Windows 98 still sealed up. This one uh, includes the disc and everything. Originally included with a Micron PC. Boy, it's been a long time since they've built them. And I've gone ahead and already installed everything, drivers and all that, on the machine just to save us some time. I was able to find all the drivers online, at least for the ones that didn't include discs in the package. Everything here is installed and working well. And I also installed some of the extra software, like, you know, Nero for burning CDs, an Acrobat reader, just some, you know, basic accessories that could make using this thing a little bit easier. But that still didn't take up too much space. You can see out of our 19 gigabytes of available hard drive, we still have almost 18 gigabytes free. 
Something I do want to tinker around with briefly is one of these LS120 discs. The drive came with a floppy that has drivers for it, but apparently they're not needed in like Windows 98 and newer. Windows just detected the drive right off the bat, and believe it or not, the BIO seems to believe that it can even boot from it as well. So what better than to um, copy some files over to this and see how well it works. Um, or not, I, uh, I was setting up the shot just to, you know, show you putting the disc in the drive. I literally went like this with the disc and the whole machine just suddenly powered off and it doesn't want to power back on again. Oh. Please tell me it's not another power supply. Okay, so I unplugged power from the LS120 drive. Oh, cross fingers that this actually makes the computer boot again. Oh, okay. All right, that's, that's much better. This drive must just be dead, which is weird. Like it only failed when I tried to put a disc inside it. And otherwise, Windows was recognizing it. I don't know. It's a bizarre failure, uh, but Good thing I've got the regular floppy drive in there, so bummer we won't be able to explore LS120 today. I think I'll be saving that for another video anyway, because there's an interesting story to be told there. But I'll put the blank back in, you know, take the drive out, and we'll move on with our lives. So I just realized something's kind of missing from this setup. We've got a good video card and a nice monitor to match. We've got a nice sound card, but, well... How about we pair it with a new old stock set of speakers? <laughs> uh, these are made by Acoustic Research, the Partners 22. Um, according to the box, it looks like they weren't necessarily meant just for computer use. They show how you can hook it up to like a Walkman or a keyboard or a TV or whatever. But the label on the other side says computer gray for multimedia. So I think these will match quite nicely. All right, let's crack these open and take a look. Ooh, separate audio cable. So these aren't the super cheap ones that come with the uh, audio cable like permanently attached to one of the speakers. These might be a little higher end. Oh yeah, they've got decent weight to them too, wow. Both of them do. These could be halfway decent. There's like a threaded insert on the back if you wanted to put them on some kind of mounting bracket. Fascinating. So this is gonna be the passive one. And yeah, this is the, uh, the active one, likely with the amplifier in it. So you've got signal in, speaker out, and then your DC 12 volt socket. Pretty beefy. 12 volt wall wart to go with them. Let's get them hooked up. What, no startup noise? What the heck? Did I plug them in wrong or something? Is it trying to use the onboard sound instead of the sound blaster? Ah, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Hey, there we go. Here, because we missed it earlier. Oh, that doesn't sound too bad. All right, so let's see what these actually sound like with MIDI music. You get a few options with the uh, Sound Blaster Autogy in here. I'm just gonna go with the, uh, I think the default was Synth A. And my favorite is Passport.mid. I just like that tune better, but I realized I hit you up with that one last time. So I think we'll just do Canyon. And uh, let me know what you think, if this sounds any good.
So I don't know about you, but I'm curious about the graphics capabilities of the video card that we installed. I'm not gonna get into playing a ton of games, partially because this video has gone on long enough and also because I kind of suck at playing games, but I do have the Quake 3 Arena demo installed on here. Let's fire it up and see what we can get in terms of performance. Also, if whoever ends up with this machine in the end wants to play more than just the demo, we've got a sealed copy of Quake 3 Team Arena that we'll just throw in with it so you can get the whole game. Yeah, so that went kind of quick. <laughs> what did we get? 112 FPS at 800 by 600 high quality. I don't think there's much to complain about with that. I'm curious about this dead power supply. I'm still bummed that I didn't get any footage of it actually blowing up, but I figure the least we can do is take it apart and see if we can figure out why. Wow, this thing is hot trash, man. Like, just the quality, it, well, there is no quality. It's like the cheapest thing I have ever seen. I mean, for starters, this thing claims that it's what, 450 watts? 450 watts max. This is the gauge of the mains AC input wiring. Like, really? Like, look at just how messy all of this is. The capacitors are just going everywhere, right? And even all these passives, just like these resistors and stuff. I mean, they just didn't care at all when they put this in. I wouldn't be surprised if some of these were sh like shorted against each other and that's what caused this thing to fail. I'm not seeing any obvious blown up parts. Though if you do look back in here closely, you can see there's like this big kind of burn mark section of the board. I don't know if that's where the problem started or if those components overheated as part of whatever failed. Thankfully the fuse blew and that's ultimately probably the pop that I may have heard, but uh, could you imagine the damage that this power supply would have caused had it been installed in the computer when it failed? And maybe the best parts, you've got the regulators on the other side of this heat sink and they've got a nut and bolt holding them, you know, secure to it. This one's not even tight. They didn't even tighten this one down all the way. Like it's just loosey goosey. What are you doing? I am not surprised that this power supply only cost, what was it, 19 bucks? It sure seems like it. So, wow, I think we really dodged a bullet with this power supply. Uh, I, I can't say I've ever seen something like this so horribly made. I've seen lots of cheap junk, you know, everyone loves to complain about all oh, this cheap crap coming from China or whatever, but I mean, this thing's 20 years old and it's clear they made junk back then too. I think that about wraps this one up. Ultimately, all of this will get taken back out to Free Geek Twin Cities and they'll sell it in their thrift store. I'm sure it'll make a retro enthusiast very happy. It may or may not have sold by the time you watch this video, but I am very happy with how all of this came together. Yeah, we had a few snags here and there, the original CRT deciding to not work, the exploding power supply, the LS120 drive that failed later on and the whole bummer with the graphics card not being in the box. But the majority of the parts inside the system were new old stock and we only had to dip into used parts when we absolutely had to. So this whole thing really is very clean and behaves as if it's brand new. And putting this thing together really took me back because I remember during that time period, the late 90s, early 2000s, putting together quite a few systems very similar to this one. And honestly being kind of envious because I couldn't really afford <laughs> quite a nice system like this at the time. But 
it was fun to put a system together from scratch again, and this whole Windows 98 era, especially in the late 90s, when you didn't have to deal with so many jumper settings on the motherboard and all that, you can just, it's a bit more fun to put these computers together because you've got that bit of retro nostalgia from the parts and the OS, but it's not quite as daunting of a task as computers from earlier in the 90s or the 80s were to get up and running. Anyway, if you like this one, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.